Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. We'll start in a few minutes. I don't hear anything. Oh, uh, we'll start in a we'll start in a, just about a minute. Thanks for joining. I could ask oh. everybody to mute their microphones as they join. Okay, I've got I've got six thirty two. Let's get started. Uh, I'll just ask once again if everybody could mute their microphones as they join. Uh, and welcome, welcome to Slugs and Steins. My name is Mike Reapy. I'm the past president of the UCSC Alumni Council. And on behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins, lectures from UC Santa Cruz. Oh, sorry for my dog. For those who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussion with you, the local community of Silicon Valley and our extended community online. The great physicist Richard P. Feynman once said, everything is interesting if you go into it deeply enough. If you agree with him, you're one of us. Uh, we want you to feel like you're at UC Santa Cruz, among the Redwoods, sitting in class, uh, but with drinks. So my usual volunteer co-organizer, David Hansen, is traveling and he's unavailable to join us this evening, but please join me in thanking him for all of his help bringing this event to you this evening. He will be watching us on YouTube later. So before we get started, uh, we'd like to take a little poll to get to know our audience and where you're tuning in from this evening. So please take a moment to answer a few questions that will pop up on your screen. We'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Should be up on your screen now. I'll fill it out too. Okay, lots of good answers coming in. Okay, it looks like it's kind of stabilizing. We've got uh, most of the people are here by themselves. We've got a uh, good number of people from Santa Cruz County in the Bay Area, 20% uh, California. We've even got 20% outside California and uh, see nobody from outside the US right now. Okay, why don't you go ahead and you can hit the end pull button to make that disappear if you've answered. Uh, and we'll share the results, I think we're good. So, um, yep, you should be able to see the results now. So before, uh, oh, so tonight uh, we raise a stein with UCSC Associate Vice Provost. This thing keeps popping into my, into my way. Okay, uh, so, uh, so tonight we raise a glass with UCSC Associate Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning and Professor of Literature, Jody Green. She will be in conversation with UCSC alumna and Foothill College professor of English, Stephanie Chan. They will be discussing the Great Reset, University Teaching and Learning After COVID. So Jody Green, PhD, is Associate Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning and Professor of Literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's also the founding director of UCSC's Center for Innovations in Teaching and Learning. In addition to educational and organizational development in higher education, Green's research interests include intellectual property, human rights, and the history of the institution of literature. In 2005, she published The Trouble with Ownership, Intellectual Property and Authorial, Authorial Liability in England from 1660 to 1730. That was with the University of Pennsylvania Press. A new volume, Human Rights After Corporate Personhood, co-edited with, with, co with Sharif Youssef, was recently published by the University of Toronto Press. Green has edited special issues of GLQ and 18th Century Studies and has published articles in journals such as PMLA, Critical Inquiry, and the 18th Century. Her most recent writing on teaching and learning trends in higher education has appeared in Inside Higher Ed and The Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, Stephanie Chan, PhD, is Associate Professor of English at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. She teaches courses in composition and literature and recently co-authored curriculum 
with which the college will inaugurate its new ethnic studies program. She got her PhD in literature from UCSC in 2014, specializing in Asian Pacific American literature and culture, and then served as a lecturer in the writing program at UCSC for three years. She is proud to have served as a TA in Professor Green's class while doing her graduate studies. Jody and Stephanie will not just be telling us how teaching and learning has changed since the pandemic, they will be showing us. As you will hear, part of that is engaging your audience, being it on Zoom or in person, in authentic experiential conversation. Jody and Stephanie will talk for about 30 minutes and then open up the conversation to all of you. You may have noticed that this is a Zoom meeting, not a webinar. You may turn your camera and microphone on. You may ask your own questions. This will be a conversation, not a lecture. But we do have some ground rules to make that work with such a large audience. If you want to speak, please use the raise hand button. To do that, click the icon labeled participants on the bottom center of your screen. A window will pop up and the bottom of that uh, is a button labeled raise hand. On a smartphone, on the smartphone, there's a three dots icon that's labeled more. It's kind of in the bottom right corner of your screen. If you change your mind, you can hit the lower hand button at any time. The presenters will see a list of hands in the order that they were raised. This is an important feature uh, for fairness called stacking. If you don't want to speak, you may ask your question in the chat box, which we will be monitoring. Please mute your microphone, except when you're speaking. We ask that you bring your true authentic selves tonight and not be shy. There are no stupid questions, and we really do want to hear your thoughts. I'm looking at you, mom and dad. Uh, so this talk is being recorded. In a few days, you'll be able to find it on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We'll post the link in our social media channels and our follow-up emails. Uh, so with that, uh, does everybody have your stein? I've got your slugs, Professor Green, Professor Chan. Thank you so much, Mike. And I'm sorry that I don't have a, a stein this evening, but maybe later. Um, I want to just start just by saying thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here and to be a part of this event and to collaborate with University Relations. Um, I have had the opportunity this year to do numerous events with University Relations. And uh, my favorite thing about University Relations is the combination of absolute professionalness or professionalism and chillness. So it just always feels, uh, I always feel really held as a speaker. Um, so I want to thank Nicole, Paulina, Nikki, Kristen, uh, Diana, Shana, and Mike. And particularly, I want to thank Stephanie. Um, it's really a delight to be reunited in this completely weird way with you. Um, so thank you so much for being willing to do this. Um, as Mike said, we wanted to have a conversation. I really think if we ever could endure long monologuing presentations on Zoom, we can't endure them anymore. So um, we wanted to have a little bit more of a lively first back and forth between the two of us and then actual conversation. And I'm particularly grateful to you are for trusting uh, us outside the webinar. Um, I know that there, are, you know, that can be a scary, <laughs> a scary thing to do, but I, I, it's so great to be able to to talk and I just wanna just finally say, I know many of you are probably making dinner uh, and feeding yourself or feeding your kids. So if you wanna ask a question, put it in the chat. And if anyone wants to ask an anonymous question, um, you can put it in the chat and direct it to Paulina, who you'll see at the top of the participant list, Paulina Fisher, and she will collect those. Um, and we can ask those questions without using your name. So totally happy to have anonymous questions or chat questions or raise hand questions. And if you put your question in the chat and you see feel like it's not being addressed, just copy it and put it again. Uh, and that will remind us that we need to take your question. So with that, we're gonna start with a poll um, it's going to be familiar to my friend Michael Tassio because we have used this poll before. So some of you will have seen this question, at least one of these questions before. Um, but we just wanted to kind of take the pulse of how you're thinking about post-pandemic teaching and learning in higher ed. And I do want to make the point that this is really about higher ed. Um, we have many experts on campus who can talk to you about what's going to happen in K-12, and I am not one of them. So um, somebody want to launch that poll? Okay. So just a question about kind of a feel. How do you feel about the changes happening in teaching and learning? And you can say as a result of or, or in the wake of, it's not necessarily because of the pandemic, um, but certainly after the pandemic, look, people are excited. Um, and then just a question really interested in, in 
learning what percentage of a college education you think will be online uh, in, in a decade. So we'll give you a minute or two. We'll give you another 30 seconds to answer those questions. It's nice that you get to have three answers to the first question if you want to. So you can be both hesitant and excited. Okay, and it looks like it's slowing down. So I'm gonna go ahead and end and publish the poll. Okay, so we have a good number of people who are excited and curious, not so many people who are nostalgic, which I hope you will come forward and say something about that later on, because that's very interesting to me. When I talk to people in the UCSC community, I often feel some nostalgia for how things used to be. So I'm thrilled. Uh, not that nostalgia is necessarily bad, but it shouldn't be the only thing that you're using to decide your educational policy. And then it looks like we're, you know, 50% of you think that 40% of a college education will be online in a, in a decade. Um, so that's a interesting. And, and one of you thinks 100% of it will be online. So I'm totally fascinated by that response. Um, so with that, I'm going to see if I can stop sharing that poll and turn it over to Stephanie. Well, it was so fun to watch all of the bars kind of uh, <laughs> jolting back and forth. Um, Jody, this is such a treat for me too. I, I uh, the circumstances um, of this reunion is just uh, it's crazy to me. And I kind of I was telling Mike I don't really know how I got here, but here we are. <laughs> it's just uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, Jody, with your permission, um, may I share a story, just a little anecdote about what it was like um, watching you teach as a TA. <laughs> Is that okay? I don't think I can really say no. So <laughs> okay, I pronounced it already. Um, so uh, you know, this took me. This brought nostalgia to me. I was I was um, thinking about how, um, as a I think this was my second year of graduate school. I was teaching um, Lit One Hundred One for you. I was teaching Lit One Hundred One. Um, which, for those of you who don't know, is one of the kind of um, required upper division courses that is uh, theory heavy. So quite a, um, you know, a, a beast for some students to, to go through um, and to be trained in, in these kind of um, just theoretical ways of, of thinking, which is a lot, a lot of times very new to students. And um, I myself was, you know, as a, as a graduate student, a young graduate student was um, just up to my eyebrows in theory and trying to make heads or tails of all these different things that then I had the opportunity to TA um, for Jody um, with. And I remember it was a large lecture and we were sitting in, I think we we're in Tiemann Hall. And uh, Jody was um, that day lecturing on the theory of the subaltern by Gayatri Spivak. And um, if you don't know this work, it's um, it's incredibly complex. It's and the language is <laughs> for a lot of people incomprehensible. It's just it's just really packed. And uh, I just watched her deliver this um, lecture. And in five minutes, she had explained the theory of the subaltern in just clear, clear language. And I went up to you afterward. I said, how did you do that? And uh, you know, you're just like, oh, you know, I just did it. So as a teacher, it was really just amazing to watch. And I think it's really amazing to, to see you in this new role and to learn. I'm really excited to learn about what you've been, what you've been up to in, in this new role. Um, so it's, it's that, yeah, this is a really, special honor for me. So let's, uh, let's start. I, um, the first question, it has to do with, um, you know, how, you know, how fr going through the last few years with Siddle, and of course, part of that involves this uh, dramatic 2020 pandemic situation, um, which, uh, you know, kind of changed things, accelerated things, um, lots of different directional stuff going on there. Um, so you know, just thinking about how um, the pandemic sort of shaped things. Um, I think in the beginning, I think a lot of people I would talk to were kind of of the opinion that going online or kind of um, shifting act, uh, higher ed to the, the virtual to online, whatever modes um, ended up happening was kind of a simple thing. You know, you just throw all your stuff online and then boom, you're done. 
Um, and same thing with the student experience. But I'm sure I don't need to convince anybody here that that's not the case. And it was actually very complex, a lot of parts, a lot of concerns um, that had to be addressed in a very short amount of time. So after, you know, like thinking about that, I wondered if you could meditate for us um, and share with us a few ways in which you think learning will be different post pandemic. Yeah, thank you for that story and um, and 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 the question. And I, I think the first thing I want to say to shape our conversation is that um, we're using the pandemic as a as a historical marker, but we also had uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the murder of George Floyd and a and a racial reckoning again in this country during this time. And as I speak this evening, I'm really going to be trying to make the case to you that all of the things that I think are going to be different after the pandemic were already going to be different. They were just going to be different on a very different time, time scale or time frame. So things that had been moving slowly got rapidly accelerated. And the two things that accelerated them, I think, were a uh, lot more attention to racial equity and justice in higher education and the, the happenstance of the technological turn. And we'll talk a lot more tonight about how to think about that. I think we think about it in a very facile way. So with that, with that lead up, I'll say three things that I can think of that will be different post pandemic, all of which would probably have been happening with or without the pandemic, but just at a different pace. The first is all education is going to be technolo technologically enhanced after uh, you know after this time. Um, I was cleaning out my attic this weekend and I was pulling out files for every course that I used to teach in the literature department. And for each course, I had a file. You know, and the file had all the materials for the course. It had all the lectures. It had all the readings. Now, all of those things will be in the learning management system. And while that was the case for some people before the pandemic, most people were not using that system at all thoroughly. So there's that part where we're sort of storing and housing our courses in a different way. And also people have just been experimenting with a really wide array of tools, many of which they wanna continue using. So lots of people are telling us they're gonna have Zoom office hours um, because students felt more comfortable and that it was more convenient for them. Uh, the Slack channel is you know, being used widely in courses. And we think that that will continue because we want students to be engaging with each other whether or not they're in person. Um, so I think that technological dimension is really important. I would even venture to say that very soon this distinction online versus in person is going to feel obsolete. Uh, and at UCSC, you know, the idea that we're going to have something called online education and then something that we call the teaching center doesn't really make a lot of sense, given that we've been joined at the hip and everything that Siddle has been credited with for the past year and a half has been in complete collaboration with online education and with uh, the folks in the instructional technology um, division. So there's technologically enhanced. The second is the equity turn. And I think the way that I would describe that is that teaching is going to be, teaching and learning are going to be the results of research, evidence, uh, and data. Um, so we've seen a big turn to using existing research and using data in particular to measure outcomes, to plan courses, to design courses. And this, and we'll talk about this more later on, this means a little bit of a change for what it means to teach at an institution like UC Santa Cruz. Um, because it means that you need to be a researcher in your research area, but then you also have to be supported to have a research and data driven approach to your teaching. You may not yourself need to become an educational researcher, but you need to know what those fields have taught us, and you will be expected to teach with some knowledge of what uh, promotes student learning. Um, the last one, I think, you know, is interesting for us at UCSC because we really have some history with this, and that's that I think the whole way we think about a college education, what it's for and how it should be conducted is changing. And while Stephanie told that very nice story about my explaining Gayatri Spivak in five minutes, the problem maybe is that I would lecture for an hour and 45 minutes. And I could do it relatively convincingly, but I wasn't necessarily checking in with the students to see about their learning, nor were I get, was I giving them very many opportunities to engage with each other. So there was a kind of a flatness or two-dimensionality 
uh, to that experience, even though we're nostalgic for its three dimensionality, I actually think it was pretty two dimensional. So if you think about experiential learning, if you think about this term active learning, which you know we have a long history of at UCSC, um, community based learning internships, uh, all of those I think we're going to see a lot more of and and then in a what is for some a more problematic or or complex turn. Um, our students are thinking much more instrumentally about their education. They are really thinking about job preparation. And they're primarily being taught by people who really are invested in the liberal arts education as a kind of a knowledge and personhood shaping experience. And so there's a little bit of a culture clash happening um, in that way. So those are the three things that I see as, you know, for sure's. That's really interesting. The culture clash I hadn't, I mean, I you kind of see it in its little kind of, um, I don't know, just uh, subtle forms and then to kind of arrive at a moment where we kind of can see a discernible, you know, gap or whatever you want to call it is really interesting. We can talk more about that later. But, you know, I want to pick up on something that you just talked about. So this idea of UCSC and its kind of tradition of, um, innovation, shall we say? I mean, I don't know if that was a lingo um, at its inception, but um, as far as, you know, kind of um, adopting ways of teaching that, you know, might be experimental or um, doing something a little different from the kind of um, conventional approaches that you see out there. I remember when I was, um, I was in, in graduate school still, we were doing um, narrative evals and that's, uh, yeah. So I don't know if that's, um, that's, that's probably a vestige of, of some of the earlier moments. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to um, have you talk a little bit about that the the um, language on the siddle per siddle um, is that it was established to honor and renew the university's longstanding tradition of outstanding teaching and bold educational experimentation. So that's in its kind of mission. Um, can you talk about this relation between Siddle and the tradition at UCSC? Um, can you reflect on this with, um, you know, you can kind of put a historical, um, you know, kind of framework around it if you want before the pandemic perhaps, and then maybe during the pandemic moments and then now and then going forward. Yeah, I mean, we could spend the whole evening on this, on this question, but, you know, one way of coming at this is to say that, um, you know, some of the things that we were doing at UCSC in the first, 25 to 30 years uh, that we needed to let go of because of the growth at the institution. Um, and, you know, frankly, being a, a pretty under-resourced institution are also things that are attested in the research as being very good for student learning. So if you think about something like the ungrading movement, right? We didn't have grades. And for me, Stephanie, the thing, by the time I got here, the narrative evaluation, we were at a scale where the narrative evaluation was not what it had been in the 60s and 70s, right? We couldn't write. I mean, I, my average class size was 150. We couldn't write those. But the fact of not having grades was much more important, right? Because people had, they felt much less anxiety. They felt mu they had much more latitude to fail and to experiment. And, you know, I miss that. And I'm so happy that the ungrading movement in higher ed is taking off. And if you want to know more about that, just Google ungrading. Um, because it, it, it's a real effort to address the ways in which learning is blocked by stress. Uh, and learning is blocked by extrinsic motivation as opposed to internal motiva intrinsic motivation. And during the pandemic, a lot of people took up ungrading because they felt like it wasn't fair to use traditional grading when people were, you know, under so much duress. But also, uh, what you know, if they were, if they were, um, you know, unused to these platforms, they're not. They didn't ask to take their courses remotely. You know, that's really different from a conversation about an online course that you've opted to take. So there's ungrading. There's, um, you know, definitely authentic assessment and experiential learning were a big part of UCSC's educational programming. And so some of the conversation to answer your question about innovation, some of it is about actual teaching practices in a particular class, but some of it is how we designed the institution, community-based learning, and then for sure this thing called active learning, right? Bell Hooks was getting her PhD here and, you know, beginning to work on 
active learning and really think about active learning in the sense of a liberatory pedagogy, right? A liberatory way of teaching that would allow students to really bring their whole selves into the classroom. That's the whole conversation that's happening in higher ed right now. How do we make more space for students to bring their whole selves into the classroom? So I think in a way the pandemic has done us a favor by driving us into the future, but with that knowledge. And I think this served us well in the pandemic in the sense that you know many of us were so overwhelmed in our work as faculty members that we we just didn't have the bandwidth to meet every student as the whole student. I mean, that was just impossible. You're trying to be a world-class research university. You've got this, you know, faculty governance structures, you've got graduate students, and then you're also trying to meet every student as a whole student. And the pandemic, as the for many people, the research slowed down. We actually were able to address our students as whole persons. And I think too, you know, Santa Cruz, I mean, I don't need to tell the people on this call, Santa Cruz has a very strong history uh, around social justice and, um, and uh, you know, liberation basically. And so the pandemic coming together with the Black Lives Matter movement also brought us back to some of our roots in really attending to uh, racial justice as part of our education on campus, not just as an object of study, but actually as a matter of, you know, life and death for, for the students who attend here now. Yeah, I know the, the way that the pandemic kind of exposed some of the things that had been kind of happening, um, but, you know, it's hard to, they're so um, embedded, sometimes it's hard to detect, but that really kind of surfaced so many things. Um, so, um, you know, now, like you, you've mentioned active learning and that, that, that I think is, um, is connected to the sort of research that Siddle does um, on behalf of faculty to help support faculty. Um, and I'm really interested to hear about what, um, what who, <laughs> who and what have, have been the, the, the research um, strategies, methodologies, people that have most influenced um, for, you, for you yourself or for, this, for the center. Um, in the last few years? Yeah, that is a really easy one. So we do read a lot of peer-reviewed research, but the thinkers who have influenced me as I've built this center are Bell Hooks, Estella Ben-Simone, and Kathy Davidson. Um, that is just so not a difficult question for me to answer. So, you know, Bell Hooks with the, with the foundation of active learning uh, and the way she talks about learning and, and the whole student has been just critical to my thinking. And one of the projects that I would love to work on is a project that actually traces the arc from Freire and Hooks all the way up to the current conversation in STEM about active learning. Because there is a through line there, but we don't, th people think that active learning was basically invented in the Obama administration to make the US competitive in STEM again. And there is some truth to that with people like Carl Wyman and others, but th there is also this other history of active learning that really, that really understands that just being talked at and not being able to engage with what you're learning is not gonna make things stick in your head. So I really read hooks for thinking about the student. Um, I think I read Ben Simone for thinking about equity um, she is our greatest thinker about equity. She was our speaker last year at Convocation, which was an unbelievable honor. Um, she recently retired from USC, um, but she has really revolutionized the conversation around equity and around institutional accountability and also to some extent faculty accountability for the outcomes of students in our classes. So rather than working primarily in the area of what we do in the classrooms, she's really trying to raise the attention about what institutional responsibility is to the students who attend. And so she is tremendously good at using data and she can do things like look at a class, look at the outcomes for the class. And, and we use this actually, we do this with instructors. We say, here are the outcomes for your class. I'm gonna write them all in the chat or if, unless someone else can for me, Michael, please. Um, so Bell Hooks, Estella Ben-Simone and, and Kathy Davidson, um, where we can look at the class, a large class and the outcomes for the class and say, in order for this class to be an equitable space, 33 more Latinx students would need to get a B or better. 
right? So we can really drill down into numbers that people can wrap their heads around when we talk about closing equity gaps. And we learned that trick from Estella, right? Instead of saying, you've got an equity gap, these percentages fix it. We say, you just got to get 20 more students, you know, not to fail basically. And how can we talk, how can we help you to do that? And then Kathy Davidson is just this very, she wrote a book called The New Education. She was our convocation speaker a few years ago. She's an old friend of mine. And she's just really interested in rethinking what does a university need to be in 2021? We still have a university from the 19th century. You know, we have a university that is, that is designed for a kind of um, knowledge in, productivity out, you learn it when you're in college and then it serves you well for the rest of your life and grades and all these things that came out of the 19th and early 20th century. And she just argues that they don't suit our current situation very well. And so freeing up student creativity and teaching creativity is really at the center of Kathy's work. And she's, she's very careful. She, she has two chapters in her book. One's called Against Technophobia and the other's called Against Technophilia. So she's really trying to think about how can we use the tools available to us in a way that supports student learning to prepare them for a world that is much more unanticipatable than the world was 100 years ago. So what does it mean to prepare someone for something that none of us can quite envision or imagine? So those are my those are my gurus. That's a big job, Jody. That's wow. <laughs> um, this is kind of a follow up question. And it sounds like um, the work then extends across fields. Is that right? Very much so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not confined to one area or another. I mean, a lot of our engagement here on campus is with STEM fields because though, in part because we have an amazing dean, uh, in particularly in, in PBSI, who's just taken this up as a preoccupation, but also the, the gaps are bigger uh, in, in the STEM disciplines. And so that's where we need to focus our attention, but that doesn't mean that we don't work all the way across. We teach a new faculty teaching academy now for two days in which around 50 new faculty members come and learn about the things that we're talking about tonight. And we have people from all five academic divisions who come to that. So that's really fun. And it's also a cohort building opportunity for them. And I do just wanna say about the research, the whole point of an entity like Siddle is that we read and metabolize the research and give it to instructors on campus, both faculty and graduate students, in a form that they can use it. We know that everybody can't go off and become an educational researcher. So it's our job to kind of digest <laughs> and then turn into websites and workshops. And you know, if you've never looked at the subtle website or that we have a Keep Teaching website, check those out because there you can see what we mean when we say that we metabolize research about student learning and give it to faculty in what we hope is a form that they can actually use. And we have a monthly newsletter that tries to do the same thing. It's, it's tremendous. I, I remember, I still think this, I mean, um, having to go so in such an accelerated fashion into virtual, all different flavors of the virtual, um, it was like training for a new job. You know, it really was just, I mean, I had all this, the content, but delivery, packaging, you know, all the kinds of um, questions of equity that you're, you're talking about and how the, you know, the, the pandemic kind of raises these equity questions and how do we meet it? Um, you know, I think um, that support was really, I think for myself was really um, essential. And I just, it's, it's, it's an incredible amount of work. Well, so, that's um, another change, Stephanie, just really quickly. That's another, yeah. when you ask me what's changed, I mean, mm -hmm. we built the center and some people came, but then COVID happened and everybody came. And so the other thing that's changing is that we, we really want faculty to be able to come and be supported. We do not like mandates from on high, do differently, do better, you know, fix equity gaps. We really think that a supported mandate is the only kind really that's going to work. And also it's much better for morale. So we really see ourselves as a support unit for faculty and graduate student instructors. That is our primary role. And the fact that students benefit is wonderful, but we're actually here to support teachers. Um, that's what we're passionate about. Okay, so, um, you know, the, the way that you've structured the, the support you know, as being research informed, highly research informed is really interesting to me because um, the, 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 the folks you just mentioned who are the main influencers, those are, you know, scholars of, and that you've mentioned before that 
um, uh, scholars of higher ed outside of UCSC have been instrumental in forming the strategies and, and the support that you're talking about. Um, but I understand also that there is a certain amount of research that's done within UCSC that informs Siddle's supports, um, which I think is really amazing because you're, you're kind of creating a model of um, using um, you're, you're leveraging scholarship for use at UCSC and it's kind of, it seems like it's keyed to the UC, UCSC student population and its needs. Um, and then it also can help to, you know, kind of systematize the equity efforts and all, all these kinds of um, concerns that you're talking about. Um, can you give us some examples of some in-house research that Siddle has been using to help with um, providing the, the support for, for faculty? Absolutely. I mean, I just want to sort of bow, you know, so deeply to one person in particular, which is my colleague, Becca Covarrubias, who will not be surprised, those of you who know me and know UCSC. Um, she runs the Student Success Equity Research Center, and her research is on um, the, the social, psychological, emotional dimensions of learning for students at UCSC. So she's a psychologist, um, and she studies student sense of belonging at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and we know we have reams of research to tell us that if you don't feel like you belong, it's very difficult to learn, particularly if you don't come in with a lot of prior educational privilege. So you might not feel like you belong, but if you have lots of prior educational privilege, you can overcome that lack of belonging. The interesting thing about UCSC being a Hispanic serving institution and what's interesting about Hispanic serving institutions is that HBCUs were built as HBCUs. They were built to serve black students. Hispanic serving institutions were not built to serve Hispanic students. They were built to serve the people who had prior educational privilege and then they become Hispanic serving institutions in the rearview mirror. And so a lot of what Becca's work is trying to do is to help, is to understand. So she doesn't, she doesn't translate it. She just does the research, which is mostly qualitative research. Um, so she does lots of interviewing uh, and finding out what student experiences are. And it's a very strengths based approach. So what we love about Becca's work, and this is in combined with the work of people like Barbara Rogoff in the psychology department here, who's the sort of great champion of cultural strengths for learning, is that we talk a lot about the liabilities and barriers that students uh, from historically underserved groups bring to campus, but we don't talk about their strengths. And so what Becca is trying to do is find out what it would take for those strengths to be accessed. And then we at Siddle try to tell instructors, you know, here's how you might be able to allow more collaboration, or here's how you might be able to give at least some assignments that allow students to bring their history or their cultural strengths with them when they come. And so her work has been tremendously influential to us in a very direct way. And we eat up all of her research and then we try to turn it around and have it inform our practice. Um, but there's also people here, there's a very new uh, person in the psychology department named Hannah Hausman who works on metacognition. And I recently read this amazing paper that she wrote with a bunch of other people about metacognition. And basically what the paper says, it's not about UCSC students, but what the paper kind of proves is that we are not very good at judging whether we understood or learned something. So if you ask students um, at most levels of the educational curriculum, did you understand what we did today? They'll be like, yeah, totally, totally got it. And then you test them and it turns out they didn't understand it so well. So even though she's not working on UCSC students, that paper has really shifted my thinking about how would we help students be better judges of whether they understood what they learned. You could do it through a no stakes assessment where you just ask them a couple questions. You could do it by reducing the stress barrier so that they're not afraid to tell you that they didn't understand it. You could do it by normalizing not knowing, which is something that you will remember from Lit 101, right? That I want people to tell me when they didn't understand or not. So that's another example of someone here at UCSC whose research I think is gonna, is gonna be really uh, fantastic for us um, going forward. Yeah, normalizing not knowing is a survival skill. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And it makes life a lot more fun too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we've been talking a lot about teaching and I mean, of course, that's the charge of Siddle. Um, but one thing that I think I'm sure you had to think about um, is you know, while you've been in kind of overdrive mode, um, having to respond to the pandemic, um, an enormous amount of energy work has, I'm sure, gone to, to thinking about teaching and all these concerns that we've been talking about now. Um, but when things go back, I'm using that really kind of um, just tentatively, um, but you know, as, as, as operations start to come back to campus, as labs start to open again, as research in its kind of material forms start to amp up more, um, how do you think um, this is going to, how is this going to play out? Um, I think uh, when the research and kind of R1 institution sort of fe features of UCSC start to um, resume, I mean, they didn't go away, but um, as, as things start to change, um, how will the focus on teaching that we've gone through so far play out post pandemic? Yeah, thank you for asking that. And it's a question that um, sits, sits, sits heavily on my shoulders because of course we're not going back. And the acceleration that's happened around um, the demands for educational equity and, and for us to do better for our students are not going to go away. And so the research mission is coming back on very strongly and yet teaching is going to be taking people teaching in the largest sense is going to be taking a lot more of people's time and energy than it has and you know a phrase that i say over and over again is please don't break the faculty uh the reason that people were not spending so much time on their teaching before is that the institution is organized to have us spend the majority of our time on our research we were hired here for our research and while ucsc has always been tremendously dedicated around teaching compared to other institutions it's still the case that if you're going to be a world-class research university and you now have to raise money for your own research in a way that you didn't in the past that's gonna take a lot of your time and energy. And if you then are asking people to spend a lot more time on their teaching, even if they want to, there's a misfit between the institution's goals and its incentive structures um, and its reward structures. And so part of what I've been trying to bring forward which seems strange because it's it might seem that it's only tangentially related to the work that I do, but it's actually really central to the work that I do as someone who supports teachers is to try to motivate a much more wide ranging conversation on campus about faculty labor and how it is distributed. Um, one of the ways that we've done great at, on campus in the last few years is to begin to have this stellar group of teaching professors. Um, who are absolutely critical, I'm looking at you Guido, who are absolutely critical to our success in this regard because they are there to help their colleagues to change their teaching and to feed their wisdom and their research area is the teaching of the thing that they teach. And so the teaching professors, the writing program and then lot, you know, lots of STEM fields um, have teaching professors and I, I just feel like that's so essential. Um, and then another, you know, the only other thing that I would say that I've seen that I think is a really cool idea is something that they did at Worcester Polytechnic, which is one of the places that really made experiential learning, put the phrase experiential learning on the map. They're famous for that. They run a summer institute in experiential learning and, and they're, you know, really amazing institution, but they're also a very strong research powerhouse. And they solved this problem by redefining research. And they said, when you come up for review, you can show your research in any of five ways. And one of those ways is traditional research objects, you know, products, books, articles, citations. One of them is community engaged research. So where you've brought your research to bear on solving a problem in the community. And one of them is engaging in transformative educational activity grounded in research. And so that is a way that I think that we could, we could um, make sure that we don't break the faculty. And also as part of that, we know that if people are constantly overstressed and overworked, it saps their creativity. And the thing about UCSC as a research university is that it's not just an amazing research university where people do amazing research. The reason that we rank so high on citation indexes or indices is because 
people tend to do field changing or redefining or founding research here. And in order to do that kind of research, you have to have your creativity. You have to. You cannot invent new fields or totally remake existing ones if you don't have some space for your creativity. So I feel really passionately invested in making sure that we leave people some of their creativity. And that's also what makes great teachers too. You know, somebody asks you a totally off the wall question and you have to be able to call on your, you can't answer from your mastery when somebody asks you a question that you didn't see coming. You have to answer from your creativity. So, you know, to me, ensuring that we keep people's creativity sacred to them is a critical part of succeeding here. And the same is true for our students. The absolute same is true for our students. If they can't afford to feed themselves, if they're working 40 hours a week, they don't have their creativity, right? If they're so stressed out. So a lot of our work is about kind of trying to figure out how to give people back the creativity that this, you know, very difficult U.S. public higher education system has left them with. Mm. Um, maybe one more question for now, Jody, from me, and then only a little one because I want to okay. hear from the people. Okay, a little one, a little one. Um, this may dovetail with what you just talked about. So, I mean, professional development has always been a feature of faculty work on campus, um, and you know, as we've been saying, you know, the pandemic created extra need for teaching support. Um, so, knowing what you've know what you know now what you've seen what do you think higher ed a higher ed institution needs structurally to support its faculty with teaching you're just talking about labor and, and thinking about balance um with creativity and and so so do, can you think of like structurally kind of speaking what sort of recommendations you might have or what sort of need you you kind of feel yeah that's such a great question and and um all of your questions have been really great questions, Stephanie. So thank you for them. Um, you know, I think we have to have a, a philosophy of support. I mean, I really believe that so passionately that we have to make sure that we have enough support in place so that people are able to meet the goals that we have institutionally and that that is not punishing to them. Right. So, you know, that means having a teaching center, but it means having a teaching center that really has faculty and graduate student interests at heart. Uh, and that is making sure not to have a deficit mindset about the faculty. I mean, I speak to people at teaching centers around the, the country who disparage the faculty. And I think, what is wrong with you? Get in some other line of work. You know, if you think the faculty are ridiculous or uncaring, then go work somewhere else because we have to be the people who believe in the faculty and who are trying to help them find their strengths and bring them to the classroom. So, you know, we need very strong partnerships between um, a unit like mine and a unit, you know, like online education or like the Faculty Instructional Technology Center. We have to take down some of those separations between those units. Um, and we we have to figure out where in the administrative structure, when I said before that the, that the life of a faculty member is changing, the work of a faculty member is changing, that means that the administrative structure of a place like the University of California, Santa Cruz also has to change to reflect that. So, you know, I don't think we need a vice chancellor of research and a vice chancellor of, vice chancellor of teaching, but it would be interesting if we had both of those things. Right. If we're really going to take the unbalance, my hands are not showing the unbalance between those and make them more balanced, then we also need to have robust support for them. If you think about how many people work in the Office of Research at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and you think about the fact that Siddle has three full time and three part time people working there, that's pretty funny. Right. We're supposed to support, you know, thousands of instructors, if you count all the graduate students with six of us and our great partner units. And then you've got hundreds of people in the Office of Research who are supporting the research endeavor. That gives you a sense of how, how out, of, out of balance in some ways we are in. And again, this isn't to fault the institution. You know, it's, we don't have, as I always say, there's no smog the dragon in Kerr Hall sitting on a giant pile of gold. You know, we are lean, lean, lean here but we have to figure out how to be smart with our resources 
to support our goals because if we don't succeed on the equity stuff, there won't be an institution here to uh, you know to worry about. Basically, um, the regents and and the legislature have made that clear. So. Yeah, it sounds like a, a key part of your role is to kind of define that need, right? To suss it out and, and to articulate it. Um, yeah. that's, that's a lot of structural movement that you're talking about. Um, shall we pause here and uh, maybe yes. give Jody a little bit of a break? Um, um, and uh, I guess we'll, we'll be inviting folks to ask questions. I kind of love Richard Hubbard's question because I'm like, yes, I do, but I never thought about it like that before. I mean, you know, my friend Enrico Ramirez Ruiz, who is an absolutely wonderful educator, and in, in addition to being the Vera Rubin chair in astrophysics, um, says, you know, that that uh, you know, intellectual intellectual merit and intellectual originality and creativity is evenly distributed across populations. So if, if we have whole populations that can't even have access to Silicon Valley to work there because they can't afford the, re the rents, we are squandering our national treasures, right? We are squandering our capacity to flourish as a nation. And that's not to say that Silicon Valley alone is the site of our flourishing. But if we don't do a good job of, of making sure that we have all the voices in Silicon Valley, we know where we're going. You know, we've got boys playing in space, you know, who don't play taxes. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense, you know? Yeah, so Richard's question in the chat is, do you think the high cost of rents in Silicon Valley are not a threat to, to national security? And I said, yes, they answered. My answer is yes, I think they are. Um, so, all right, let's see. So throw your hand up. I still say blue hand, but they're not blue anymore. You can also go down, if you didn't find that, you can go down to the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and click on that. And there's also an opportunity to raise your hand there. And then you can lower your hand after you ask your question. Um, okay, J and then M, I'm excited to hear your question. And remember, you can put a question in the chat. And just for those who came late, if you wanna ask a question anonymously, you, go in the chat and find Paulina Fisher's name and ask her your question. So, and she'll repeat it to us without saying who you are. But Jay, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, uh, can Hi. you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, so I recently graduated UC Santa Cruz, December 2020, and I'm working for a company called Yuja, which is an oh. educational technology company that UC Santa Cruz actually uses. We're familiar with them. <laughs> yeah, and I would love to try to get Foothill as well onto it too. Um, Stephanie, hi. Yeah, so um, my question is, uh, and you know, if you want to hire anyone from the Center of Teaching and Learning, you know, I'm right here. Do I? My job is to really talk to instructional designers and instructional technologists and kind of get um, a little feel about their institutions and everything like that. Um, you know, one thing that I really noticed around COVID is it really woke a lot of institutions up to accessibility. Um, yes. How do you teach? the faculty and especially the students about accessibility and trying to make the their content as accessible as possible. Um, I've been talking to a lot of schools in actually Colorado and uh, one school, I think it was Boulder, um, actually got an accessibility audit and uh, they weren't prepared for it. So they had to switch a lot of their technologies um, to be more ADA compliant, um, WCAG uh, 2.1 standard. Yeah. And I was wondering just how do you keep your, uh, how do you, Kind of teach the faculty about these technologies and how do you also teach them about accessibility as well yeah thank you jay for that question and that is uh, that is like my one of my favorite questions um and uh, uh, there are other people on the call who could certainly speak to this issue but um i do believe that the pandemic brought the the matter of accessible technologies to the fore in a way that it hadn't been before now let me say we're very lucky in the university of california because we have a body up at UCOP that um, does a very deep analysis uh, of ADA compliance. So accessibility, data privacy, and data security are assessed at the systems level and then again at the campus level. So in terms of our core technologies, they do, uh, you know, they do that work on some level for us. Um, at the same time, 
right? We also have um, dimensions of accessibility that are at the instructor level, like for instance, making sure that your PDFs are accessible. We were extremely lucky during COVID to get money. Um, thank you, Michael Tassio, uh, from, I mean, because it was Michael, he's on the call, he's the director of online education, he's my partner in crime, and he, you know, he made sure that we got money from the CARES Act for accessibility and accessibility core, which was student workers who could do that document transformation for instructors, because it's just too many things for people to be trying to learn at the same time. They were trying to learn to use UGIA, which wasn't always intuitive for them. So, you know, we had help to do that. And then at the same time, ever since CITL started, we've been working very closely with our Disability Resource Center to think about accessibility more at the granular level in classes. You know, what does it really mean to design universally? Um, and because every class at UCSC had to be redesigned during COVID, every single one, 2,000 classes a quarter, we had a lot of, and people were coming to us for help, we had a lot of opportunity to recommend to people how to make their classes more accessible. Now, there's a set of accessibility uh, requirements that has to do with the ADA, and those are, you know, legal as well as pedagogical. Um, but accessibility is a much broader conversation. If you can't afford to buy the textbook, that class is not accessible to you. So the conversation about accessibility on campus right now is, is very wide ranging. And um, we're lucky because we're actually, I'm co-chair of a search committee to hire an ADA compliance officer, chief officer for the campus. So that's gonna be a big, um, a great resource for us, I think, going forward. But thank you for bringing up the issue of accessibility. It's it's very, very dear to our hearts. Yeah, Em. Uh, thank you so much. I am a, a friend of, of UCSC um, and I'm here in Pittsburgh um, and I do work on uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, but I do work with HSIs. And um, as part of my dissertation, I've actually been working with students at UCSC uh, students, Latinx students with disabilities. And so I'm really happy that my question follows Jay's question yeah, because it's complementary and yet a little bit oppositional or a little bit a different approach. Um, I don't think a lot about accessibility. I'm, I'm grateful for people that do, um, but I think a lot of, more about the holistic student experience and mm -hmm. not necessarily compliance, but true support. So my question is, um, how do you and Siddle and maybe the university um, approach ableism and racism and those intersections, especially in the context of um, supporting a holistic student experience. So things they might not necessarily get from um, disability resource services or you know other formal structures. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question and and that it's a huge question, not just the intersection, but also you know how are we serving? How are we making this institution accessible in all the ways, right? At the same time, because I think that's really what your question is is getting to. Um, so you know, we try one example of what we try to do is that we um, we offered uh, workshops actually before the pandemic, but a lot more of them during the pandemic on um, supporting students facing academic and personal challenges. And that rubric was a way of trying to talk about all of these intersectional challenges that our students face at the same time, both to help um, faculty members become what one person in my line of work calls experts at referral. So we know that faculty members cannot and should not themselves be a resource to every student. There's absolutely no way that you can scale that, but they do need and they have a responsibility to be experts at referral. So we make sure that they know where they can direct students for help. At the same time, during COVID, we talked a great deal about an ethic of care in teaching. Um, and we also taught workshops on trauma-informed teaching. So that was a way of also trying to bring forward a conversation about the intersectional challenges and barriers that our students face. I think about it a lot and speak about it with my colleagues a lot in terms of friction. And this seems to be a way that is people begin to understand it. Some people enter these institutions and they experience no friction or very, very minimal friction. And other students are facing the exact same learning challenges, but there's just friction 
everywhere. There's friction in 360 degrees. There's friction at home. There's friction trying to, you know, find a place to live. There's friction trying to get their accommodations. There's friction trying to feel like they belong. And so those compounding dimensions of friction mean that you might be set up to learn, but you just can't even get to the learning because you're constantly slowed by all of these frictional forces that you face. So the last thing I'll say is that we have a faculty fellows group um, at uh, Siddle, which is, you know, in some ways, at least before the pandemic was my, you know, my heart place at Siddle where we gather um, around 20 faculty members. We meet for lunch every other week for the entire academic year. They don't receive any remuneration for doing this except they get lunch. Uh, and we talk about topics related to teaching and we had arranged before, so two years ago, we brought a group together to talk about a, a group of very hot topics. So it was disability, uh, mental health, resilience, and um, you know, flourishing, basically. And to try to think about, with all the support that students get, what is the faculty role in supporting those dimensions of student life? Then, Derek Chauvin put his knee on George Floyd's neck, and we had the conversation really open around how racial injustice intersects with those features. And so the, the fellows went through one year, and then they asked if they could do a second year. And they met every other week on Zoom for this entire year during COVID when nobody wanted to Zoom another two hours and talked about how we can do better for our students around these issues. And we had visiting speakers and amazing people coming. So the answer is those things are at the center of our concerns. And we're really just at the very beginning of figuring out how to do better uh, for our students. Bring it. Okay, Michael, when I consider the shift to technology enhanced teaching, what do I view as the traps or pitfalls that UCSC needs to be cautious to avoid? I really should ask you that question, but I'll go first. Um, you know, I mean, I think that the, the first one is the, how do I say this most generously? Um, the pace of the rollout of educational technology right now is at a fever pitch. And speaking of pitched, um, I get pitched uh, about 10 times a day with new tools and unfortunately, so do my colleagues. And so this actually goes back to Jay's question and a little bit to M's question, because we do see people taking up technological tools that actually haven't been vetted at the highest level because they're being pitched to them by ed tech places. And so how do we, we call it, Michael and I call it going rogue. What do we do about people who are going rogue in using technologies? And if they've been using them for a year or two, how do you take the toy away, right? So we have a wonderful message uh, engagement platform that we love called Piazza. Lots of faculty members have been using it, but Piazza has just changed its business model and we are having to tell people that we are not going to support that anymore and that if they choose to use it they have to be willing to have certain kinds of advertisements so there's a lot of college teaching used to just be very kind of pristine i mean aside from not ordering super extensive expensive books you were not really interacting with profit makers in your teaching and now you're really having to think about that so definitely the technological um, the technological arms race, as I think of it, is big. Um, another thing is just that it's, we really need to study learning and grades are not a good way to do that. Um, and you and I were in some meetings today on this topic. So, you know, I do not consider online versus not online to be a particularly interesting distinction when it comes to learning. I'm interested in how that course was designed how much thought was put into accessibility and um, learning. 
and uh, how much support that person was given. Um, and so my worry about the quick takes that people are really into right now, particularly extrapolating from learning in a pandemic to there's something wrong with online education, very bad, not thoughtful. Uh, that's something that I really worry about is that bad, um, hi Miranda, um, bad, like bad science basically. So we need to become better and also more agile at measuring learning across higher ed, but particularly as we're trying to figure out what works in terms of techno technologically mediated instruction. Because here's the other thing that I didn't say at the beginning, but that I probably should have said, is that the demand for more online and technologically mediated learning is not going to come from the institution. It is coming from the students. They want to not have to go to class. And so, and right now they want, if they're taking a lecture course to be able to decide on any given day, can I show up in person or not? You know, can I stay home? And five or 10 years from now, we'll have the technology for that, but we don't have that now. And so how do we not get caught up in this, you know, meeting the demand for flexibility and be honest about the fact that the technology is not here yet uh, for that. So the last thing I'll say is one of the big um, opportunities is adaptive learning um, or personalized learning. And really technology is necessary for that outside of the tutorial form at Oxford. If you're gonna personalize learning, you need technology to help you do that. And so how do you help students progress at a pace that's appropriate for them? It's very hard to do that in an online classroom. And so I think one of the promises is more personalized and adaptive um, opportunities. I hope I did justice to your question. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Hi, Jody. Really great talk. And I really like at the beginning you said this is an acceleration of trends, right? That was helpful for me to see and look back. Um, my question is during during lockdown, I've been attending lots and lots of Zooms, and they were not university based, but there were lots of university professors who were coming in. Um, the ungrading helmet was there otherwise, but do you think uh, online also includes expanding education beyond the geographical campus environment? So pulling in educators and other resources outside the traditional geographic region? Oh, 100%. I mean, I sort of said at the beginning, I'm talking about higher ed, not K-12, but I also should have said, I'm talking about bachelor and, and master's and PhD degrees, not education right. more generally. I mean, I think we have incredible opportunities. I'm taking a class right now on Zoom on Buddhist perspectives on nature. That's one of the most exciting things that I've ever been involved in. I feel like I just met my people in this class. You know, they're very serious Buddhist practitioners, many of whom are also academics and study critical theory. And this group of people could never, ever have come together. We have people in India, we have someone in Denmark, and we're all in real time taking a class together that was carefully put at a time of day that all of us could attend. And so I think the opportunity to be lifelong learners um, is definitely gonna be opened up by what we've just learned in the pandemic. And I feel super excited about that. What I'm, what I'm a lot less clear around is what's gonna happen to the bachelor's degree. Um, I think there's still going to be a lot of demand from relatively privileged folks for the four-year residential experience, I think, without question. Um, and, and those are often folks for whom the value proposition is somewhat beside the point. Um, they really are going to college for the experience, you know. Um, what I'm not as clear about is if people really want to use instances of higher education offerings pretty specifically for career preparation, is the four-year bachelor's degree the appropriate avenue for that? And I think that's where we're going to see a lot of, I can't believe I'm going to say this word, disruption um, in the next decade as, you know, credentials and um, 
you know, stackable credentials and things like that become much more common. The last thing I'll also say is just that the community college is um, absolutely a gem. And we've really begun to understand how the community college can help us get out of the hole of four-year education's financial challenge, you know, that it costs a lot to do this thing that we do here. And it's almost all personnel. And so the only way to cut costs is to underserve. That's what I would say. Either to underserve by having contingent faculty or to underserve by cutting services. Um, that's the only way you can save money in higher ed. There is no fat on this chicken wing. I mean, I'm here to tell you that there's just no waste at this institution. And, and so how we solve that problem, I think is really critical. Yeah, thank you. Good answers. You bet. Mike. Yeah, thank you, Jody. I just want to, I want to encourage everybody out there. Uh, you know, we do want to hear your questions. So feel free to jump in. Don't be shy. You know, you can have questions if you have an experience you'd like to share. Maybe there's a student or a parent who has some direct experience or some ideas to share. Uh, but my, my question, um, my experience wasn't as a faculty member, but it, uh, as a graduate student. Um, I, I wonder if you're, you, you, know, you, you did mention a bit about the graduate student experience. Um, if you have like a top five list of things to think about for graduate students, you know, I, it wasn't typical in my experience to get any training in, in how to teach or even ex any expectation to attend class. Great. So, yes. So we, um, in the first year after I was appointed to, to found Siddle, I said that I wouldn't do any programming for a year because I wanted to understand. I didn't know anything about this line of work, and that was only five years ago. So one of the things that I realized initially is you have to decide right out of the gate, are you going to have separate units for graduate student professional development and faculty development, or are you going to have one unit to do both of those things. Berkeley has two, all the other UCs have one. So we decided right away that we would um, build one and that has served us very well. We have an incredible associate director who does all of our graduate programs, all of them, one person, Kendra Doherty, and that includes TA training for all TAs at UCSC, plus course design for people who are becoming GSIs, graduate student instructors. Um, so. I, I don't know if I'll give you five things, but what I will say as the most important thing is that one of the things that became clear in that process is that if an institution like UCSC is going to solve its equity challenges, the teaching assistant has an absolutely critical role to play. And so you brought up a great example that I'm always banging on about, right? What happens if the TA doesn't go to class in intro chemistry? Then the students come to the problem session or the section, which is probably optional, which is also a problem, right? And they ask about something that they saw in class and the TA answers the question the way they were taught it, not the way the students saw it in class that morning. If that student is already worried that they can't succeed in this class, that literally causes a nuclear meltdown in their brain because they think that's not how it was explained to me. Right, we hear this in math all the time. They get given a demonstration that doesn't correspond to what they saw. So we have put a lot of energy into replicating a program very successfully that they did at UC Irvine, where we have in, in the first two years that we were doing programming, we put a trained TA trainer in every department that offers TA ships at UCSC that had a foundation in evidence-based teaching practices and equitable teaching practices. And so they then train the TAs um, and, and uh, pass that on to them. So I think that's absolutely critical. I also think we have this challenge, right? Which is that everything that I said about how faculty members are now supposed to have a foundation in research and evidence-based teaching practices, now graduate students are supposed to get that when they're in graduate school. But we only have one person for this entire university to try to give that preparation. So, and we don't necessarily want the faculty to give that preparation because the faculty like me, right? We didn't get any training. So all we're doing is just replicating, right? We're just replicating something that doesn't really work. So we need to make sure that we train up the next generation of college teaching professionals to actually be able to teach in the ways that we know and that research tells us are essential. Um, the one place that we have not had bandwidth 
to go is about how graduate education itself is conducted. And I think that's sort of the next the next frontier, like graduate seminars on the non-STEM part of the university. How do they work? Do they work? What do people learn? Um, so those are some of the things that we are um, that we're working on. Thank you for asking about graduate students. Hey Jody, I have a question that came in. Um, what is your ideal higher ed institution ten years from now? Oh my gosh, Mills College. <laughs> no, um, that is an absolutely fantastic question um, that I don't really think about very often because I'm trying to think about the one that I'm in right now and how to move it forward. But I think, um, you know, the first word that comes to mind is, uh, is humane. Um, there's something deeply inhumane about public education in this country at this juncture. Um, the students can't afford to be students here and you know that no one is particularly supported. So what I would like for us to do is wake up as a country and invest in public education again, uh, understand it as a public good and not a private good. And then I think allow a lot of choice um, there are, as I said, still going to be people who want a four-year residential education, and I would like for them to be able to have that. But I would also like to see these institutions think about the travel industry and think about how much of travel, the travel industry, is paid for by corporations, right? It is funded by corporations. And when you're traveling on business, you can spend as much money as you want because it's not your money. Right now, this is a problem for the rest of us because, of course, those costs get passed on to us. But there's a way in which I wish we could figure out how to do a better job of linking up the needs of corporations with an ever evolving set of skills that their people need to have with institutions of higher education that can actually give people those skills. So I, I hope that there are sort of different ways that you can be involved with an institution, I think one of the challenges that we're going to be seeing is that, um, you know, what if somebody wants to take a class at, at Pittsburgh with M and they want to take a class at Santa Cruz with me and they want to take a class, you know, at some very fancy school, right? Why do people need to take all of their classes in the same in the same place. So probably what you're going to see is a lot of growth in the extension sector, about which I know very little. But I think the idea that extension is going to grow and also that it's going to be that the teachers there are going to be teacher practitioners rather than teacher scholars necessarily. Um, I think that's a big uh, that's a big future. Um, so I hope I answered your question. It wasn't my most utopian response. Whoa, hi, Kathy. Um, okay, I'm a UCSC alum and I have been teaching at community college for almost 30 years. I never taught online until we had to. I'm currently taking a course on intro to online teaching and learning. And I have realized that the, uh, what you said early on that the distinction between online and in-person is fading. I did not think I would wanna teach online but realized I will likely be doing some combination. In my course, I'm also finding what you said about so much tech to learn. What advice would you give for me as I am starting to make this transition? Resources, papers, webinars. I teach math at Citrus College in Southern California, and we are also an HSI. Um, so it sounds like you're doing one thing that you can definitely do, which is to take an intro to online teaching and learning. I would um, make sure that you know who the instructional support professionals are at your institution, if there are any, and I'm not saying that there necessarily are, but before, um, before COVID, we had instructional designers in a completely different place from the teaching center at UCSC. Of course, we only had one instructional designer, but that doesn't really make any sense, right? Because if you're trying to learn how to redesign a course equitably and you know, also learn the technology, all of that should be in the same place. So it isn't necessarily. So you need to find out who, you know, you need to see where the helpers are on your campus. But also, I don't know if the course that you're taking is a kind of widely available one, but there are some absolutely amazing outfits 
that are popping up that have very inexpensive instruction on how to teach effectively in a technologically enhanced way. And that's in part because they're designed for lecturers. Uh, so they're not pricing things in this very, very expensive way. And so, you know, the, um, the, the, you know, I would, I would just start Googling around, right, for learning how in higher ed to teach in a technologically enhanced way. As far as learning the tools, you know, I think finding a colleague who's learned them is the most important thing. Learning, learning, learning communities, whether they're formal or informal, are absolutely critical to change in higher ed teaching and learning because most people will listen and learn better from the colleague down the hall than they do from uh, uh, someone who's a, a professional in this. Um, all right, Jay, you got another one for me. And this will be our last question from the audience. Oh yeah, I was just gonna piggyback off of that. Um, talking with probably the instructional designer and technologist would be your best bet. Um, if you have one, if you have one. I yeah, just wanna I've, be realistic, not everybody has those. I've noticed that in a lot of organizations that they don't use the technologies because they aren't trained uh, you know, how to teach the faculty using these technologies. A lot of the times I see that they purchase them and they just simply don't do anything with them. Yeah. Um, uh, you said something about earlier when you started this conversation about being like online. I, like I said, I, I talk with a lot of institutions and every institution has a learning management system. So in a way, would you say that everything is kind of online and will be online? Yeah, that's what I meant when I said, you know, borrowing from, from my colleague Van Williams, who's our head of IT, that all education in the future will be technologically enhanced. Most of it was, except maybe people like me who didn't use slides and didn't use the learning management system. But, um, you know, now we have really fully made that transition. I think we need to think about it as a spectrum. Uh, and one, and there's some great charts about this. One spectrum has to do with sort of how much technology you're using and how you're using it. And another spectrum has to do with how people spend their time, right? We use this synchronous versus asynchronous distinction, but it's a very blunt. A lot of a college class has always been asynchronous. It's called your homework or your lab or your problem session, right? So it's where, where is the face-to-face -face engagement um, which could be in person or not, where is the um, engagement through mediation like Slack? And then where is the go off alone and, and do that? Um, the other thing that I wanna say is that, and this goes back to Kathy's question, is um, the, one of the things that I love most about being in professional development is that it's open source. So I can call any teaching center in the country and say, would it be okay with you if we borrowed your materials and adapted them for UCSC? Or I get calls all the time. Do you guys have a workshop on anti-racist teaching practices? Can we have a look at it? We send them the slides. Everything is shared. No, the, nobody is proprietary about their stuff because everybody is under-resourced, right? So we have to borrow from each other. So that means that you can go noodle around other campuses websites and see what they have. We have an, you know, a course design, online course design uh, platform, you know, protocol here that I think is shareable. So, you know, we have a lot of stuff that, that in higher ed that we've really had to collaborate over the past year in order to get the job done. And the fact that we have gotten the job done is, is astonishing. I mean, I just, there goes the story that higher ed can't be agile, you know? We put this university online in a week, in a week. I mean, sorry, but I can't hear it about how we can't change. That was an astonishing feat. And it was done through the goodwill of, you know, 40 people plus every instructor on the campus just getting together and getting it done. So, um, you know, ha have a look at the Keep Teaching website if you haven't. It's really pretty inspiring. And it's kind of the, the uh, it's, it's, what, it's what remains of, of what we just did for the last 18 months. So. Mike, I think I'm gonna give it back to you. Thank you, Jody. Wow, I am, I am floored and speechless. What an amazing conversation. Um, <clears throat> if we could just get a round of applause from everybody, or you, can, uh, you can unmute and applaud, or you can use the, you know, use the feed, the, the, <laughs> use the reactions button. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for sharing your fascinating insights with, uh, with our audience this evening. 
Uh, once again, this talk has been recorded and it will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in a few days. Uh, and we'll put that out in our uh, social media posts and thank you letters. If you would like to support uh, Foothill College uh, where uh, Stephanie is teaching, uh, they do have a fund for areas of most need. You can donate online to the Foothill College President's Fund uh, by visiting uh, a link. I think we'll we have somebody post that into the chat um, and designated uh, your donation to Foothill College. Uh, if you're interested in supporting Jody's work with the Center for Innovation, Teaching and Learning, uh, we also called it CIDL, that would be greatly appreciated. Philanthropic support is critical for the success of UC Santa Cruz's community. Um, staff will add the link in the chat box again, and uh, thank you for your consideration in, in making a gift. Uh, we can do none of this without private support. So uh, also I'd like to thank the uh, staff from the alumni and special events offices who set up this online forum for us and, and, and made it run perfectly smoothly. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Shana, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. So our next event, Monday, August 9th, this will feature professor, uh, UCSC Professor of Philosophy, Jeanette Dinashak. She'll be lecturing on the neurodiversity perspective of autism, what it is and how it matters. Uh, Jeanette Dinashak is an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Associate Director of the Center for Public Philosophy at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She specializes in the philosophy of psychology and psychiatry, the 20th century Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein and the ethics and epistemology of other minds. Much of her research and teaching takes on an interdisciplinary perspective and focuses on autism, disability, neurodiversity, and the patholo pathologization of human differences. Meanwhile, if you are a re recent UCSD graduate, we encourage you to check out the Alumni Summer Career Series. Harness the power of your alumni network by connecting with UCSD grads from all different fields. Our six session series kicks off July 14th, that's this Monday, this Wednesday, and it continues every other week throughout the summer with plenty of opportunities to speak with successful alumni in smaller breakout sessions and ask questions to qualified presenters. Our summer series will, uh, will undoubtedly give you all the advice you need. Go to alumni.ucsc.edu and look at the alumni events tab and we'll put a link in the chat box. In addition, the UCSC Farm and Garden Project has a rich series of summer events coming up over the next few months. There's the talk on baking with botanicals on July 24th, uh, sketching in the garden on August 4th. There's an evening with Shea Farmer Matthew Rayford on August 25th, and a talk on seed saving and seed sovereignty on August 31st. See events.ucsc.edu for more information about these and everything else going on. On behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you again for joining us, and please come back on August 9th, 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event. Bye, everybody. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.